If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We've said it several times. This is probably the most personal of all of the letters that Paul wrote. The most emotional letter that he wrote. We sense his heart and, and he's dealing with the church at Corinth and those who have swayed them and turned them from him. Trying to move them from the gospel back into Judaism, religion. And Paul is appealing to them and reminding them what ministry really is. And we desperately need to be reminded today of that. I'm excited about this chapter because in this chapter, Paul's going to talk about ministry musts, musts. There are musts in ministry. And he's going to talk about three big ones. The first, cooperation. The second, determination. And the third, separation. These are vital for ministry. And look at verse 1. Speaking of cooperation, he says, We then as workers together with him. Well, we could stop there. Let me read that again. We then as workers together with him. I could spend the rest of our time together sharing with you my heart on this verse. Workers together with him. Many people don't realize that in the church anymore. Many in the church today think it, it works like this. We've got a work to do. So we're going to show up and do that work. And we're going to hope God blesses us. As we do the work. We'll put committees together so they can design the work and figure out the work and plan the work and schedule the work. And we'll promote the work for certain days and certain times. If that's the way you think ministry operates, you are wrong. Now, you may be very comfortable with that. You may be familiar with that. You know, a, a jukebox plays every Sunday and we just go through a certain number of songs and, and every church has their number. You can't deviate from that or be careful. Prayers are wrote and rehearsed. Oftentimes, thoughtless. And then there's lectures. Sometimes sermonettes. Sometimes motivational speeches. And we call it the work of the ministry. And lost people feel comfortable in the service. Sinners feel comfortable in the service. The hurting leave hurt. The addicted leave addicted. The sick leave sick. Because, well, we have no power. We have no ability on our own. Jesus didn't say to his disciples, now, now you boys run along and do the ministry. Good luck to you. He didn't do that. It's not even so much as we work for the Lord. Paul says, we work with him. I've been in the ministry for a long time. And I can't tell you how many times I've gotten in trouble. I've stayed in trouble most of my time in ministry. 
Because men have told me how to do ministry. But the trouble I get into is Jesus tells me something different than what the men tell me. And I've just been dumb enough through the years, I guess. It's not because I'm holy or righteous or spiritual to do what Jesus tells me. Because I figure if I'm on the wrong side of somebody, I would rather be on the wrong side of men than on the wrong side of him. And so I get called to the carpet all the time. You can't do it like that. You don't do that. You don't do this. And you're doing this wrong. And you're doing that wrong. And you're doing that wrong. And, and I go, okay, sorry. And I run back to Jesus. And I say, Lord, you've heard what's been said. And I, I want to do what, well, I want them to like me. But I want to do what you want me to do. Because there's coming a day when I'm going to stand before you. And they, whoever they are, are not going to be there. Paul says, we're workers together with him. Now, let me just remind you, church. That means you can't do ministry without prayer. And I'm not talking about, Lord, bless what we're going to do. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> and nothing would change if Jesus wasn't even in the midst. We're workers together with him, which means I've got to be looking to him. I've got to be listening to him. I've got to try to be in tune. I got to, I don't know how else to describe. I got to put my feelers out, you know, I mean, and we make mistakes in this process, but it's like, oh Lord, I'm going downhill with my foot on the brake. It's like, I just want to stay at the speed you want me to be at. I don't want to get out ahead of you. I don't want to slow down and get behind you. I just, I just want to be in what you're doing. Jesus got into trouble now that I think about it. He was always working and doing things at the wrong time and the wrong way and the wrong place. And those same men got onto him and said, you can't do that. And you can't do that. Who told you to pick up your mat? Don't you know what day it is? And you know what he responded? In John chapter 5, my father works hitherto and I work. See, we could learn a lesson this morning about our Savior. He's always saying, my Father, my Father, my Father, my Father. I say what pleases my Father. I do what pleases my Father. My doctrine is not my own, but my Father's that sent me. I can do nothing of myself, but, but my Father that's in me. And if Jesus relied upon the Father for ministry, how do I think? How do we think? We know how to do this. I've been doing this for 30 years. You open up in prayer. You sing a couple songs. Share a few scriptures. And you pray again. And you got to get out of here. Because folks are hungry. I would rather you leave with your belly growling. And your soul fat. Than the other way around. And if this pastor is going to err. That's where I'm going to err. Because I'm working together with him. And he's in our midst this morning. And he knows your struggles. And he knows your weaknesses. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're afraid of. He knows what you know and what you don't know. And he knows what you know and what you need to know. Yes. And he's here today, right now, working in our midst. Yes. And all he's asked us to do is work with him. It's, it's like a dad pushing a lawnmower through the yard. And his son is behind him with a little plastic lawnmower. He's doing nothing for the yard. And the truth is, dad could get a lot more done if he would just say, go in the house and play with your Legos. But he loves his son. And to him, it's about time. 
And he knows if his son is ever going to grow up to be the man he's supposed to be, he's got to spend time with the man that he sees. And if you and I are going to become like our father, like our savior, we're going to have to spend time with him. And the way he does that, he lets us work with him. And so the attitude should be, Lord, what do you want to do today? And if the Lord wants me to stay on verse 1 for the rest of our time, so be it. If he wants me to do four chapters, so be it. If he wants us to do eight songs and one verse, so be it. If he wants us to do one song and a whole book, so be it. If he wants us to show up and do no songs, no book, and pray. It's his work. And Paul says this is a must in ministry. Cooperation. You and I have to learn to cooperate with the Lord. And recognize it's not my work. It's not my doing. It's his work. He's doing something. And so I don't come over and I'm going to do this. and Lord bless it. No. I spend time saying Lord what do you want to do? I don't spend the week preparing my message. I'm praying, Lord, what is your message? I don't know who's going to show up on Sunday. I have no idea, but you do. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. All this is good stuff, Lord. I want to say all of it, but... They won't hang around that long. So, so, Lord, what do you want me to say today? And what do you want me not to say today? And that's ministry. That's how you be a dad, dads. You wake up every day. and You have given me this sacred, solemn stewardship. These are not my children. You have given them to me on loan. I don't know how to, I don't know what their future is. I, I don't know what your calling is for their lives, but you have given them to me. How do I equip them? How do I prepare them? You spouses, do you really know what's going on in your spouse's heart? Where are they in their relationship with the Lord? What areas does Jesus want to deal with right now for them? Hmm? You're not going to know that. Unless you wake up every day and say, Lord. If you're a wife, how, how do I support my husband? Lord, you've called me to submit and, and that's a struggle sometimes. But I know I'm submitting to you. But what would make it even easier is if you are able to make my man the man you want him to be. And so I'm praying for my man. Draw him close to you, Lord. Pull him close. How can I work with you? So Paul, after beseeching sinners in chapter 5, be reconciled to God. We find him now in chapter 1, beseeching the saints. Look what he says. That you receive not the grace of God in vain. Now, let me quickly say, He's not saying, be sure I beseech you, don't lose your salvation. That's not what he's saying. If you remember from his first letter, in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. And it's his grace which was given to me, right, allowed me to work and labor more than any other. This grace that he's given me. He saved me. I'm heaven bound. I've got a reservation. The truth is, from an eternal perspective, I'm already there. But he left me here. Not so that I could live it up, as we saw in the last chapter. Not to live for ourselves, but to serve him. And to work with him. And to be a part of what he's doing. This is exciting to me. Years and years ago, man, it's been forever. There was a song called Thank You. 
And the song was, was about the saint making their way into heaven and individuals coming up and, and saying, hey, thank you. You know, that little child, I don't know, from India, Madagascar, Operation Shoebox, running up to you and saying, thank you. You know, that little toy truck, that little water bottle, that little t-shirt you rolled up and stuck in that box. Because of that box, I heard the gospel. Because of that act of working with the Lord, I'm here. Because of that offering, because of that prayer you prayed, because of that thing you said, because of the time that you stopped in the hallway and prayed for me when I shared with you what was going on in my life. We get to work with God. And this is a grace. We've received this ministry. And we shouldn't receive it in vain. At the end of chapter 15, Paul says, Be steadfast, therefore unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's not in vain. Look at verse two. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted and in the day of salvation I have succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Not only are we to cooperate with the Lord, as Paul said in chapter 5, verse 20, we are ambassadors. We're ambassadors for Christ. We represent him. Do you know that an ambassador has no authority of his own or her own? And an ambassador is not to have his or her own agenda either. And an ambassador is not on his or her own time. Paul quotes from Isaiah. And he says, now is the time. When should you get serious about the Lord? Now. When should you be focusing on 2 Corinthians chapter 6? Now. When is the day of salvation? Today. And when we get to tomorrow, tomorrow is going to be today. And it's going to be the day of salvation. And the next day is not going to be the next day. It's going to be today. Do you know that every day is today? There really is no tomorrow. We're waiting on tomorrows. Tomorrow I'm going to get serious with the Lord. Tomorrow I'm going to start my quiet time. Tomorrow I'm going to sign up for this ministry or that ministry. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. That is Satan's favorite day. Tomorrow. And all the while, the Lord is saying, today, 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 now, right now, this is your moment. What are you waiting for? This is your moment right now. You are not here by accident. I am not here by accident. This is a God thing. This is God's work. And what we should be doing is, Lord, what can I do? Put me in. How, how can I help? What can I do? Cooperation. We're not trying to get God to cooperate with us. Our life should be cooperating with him. Walking in his spirit, moving in his spirit. Jesus told his disciples, hey, don't you go anywhere, don't do anything. You go to Jerusalem and wait. You wait. I don't believe there's a waiting period anymore for saints. When we're saved, we receive the Holy Spirit into our lives. But that doesn't mean we don't need to wait in the sense of, Lord, what are you doing? We don't need to pray. In the Old Testament, there's a story of a man named Cushai and a man named Abishai. Abishai is like, let me run, let me run. I want to go tell, tell David. I want to go tell him. I'm going to go tell him. Let me run. I'm ready to run. Put me in, coach. Put me in, coach. Put me in, coach. And he was told by the commander, no, no, no. Cushai is going to go. Oh, come on, come on. Let me go. Let me go too. Let me go too. He sends Cushai. He goes running. And he keeps on and he keeps on. Put me in, put me in, put me in. Let me do it. Let me do it. Let me do it. I know what to do. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Okay, fine, fine. Go. Abishai takes off. Boom. Man, he can run. He, he, he catches up with Cushai. See ya. And he comes barging into the king's presence. So, so how's it going? 
David asked. Um, well, you know, well, uh, um, I really didn't see myself what happened. Um, I'm not, and he's fumbling and stumbling, and, and the watchman says, I see another runner, and he looks like Cushai, and David says, hey, stand aside, Abishai. I don't think it's Abishai. Am I? I'm getting them mixed up. Anyway, it's Cushai and another guy. Uh, you can go look it up. Anyway, <laughs> Cushai shows up and tells the king the news. I'm convinced there's a lot of stumbling and fumbling and stuttering in the church today. Because we just run. We just run out there. We just run out there. Moses. Moses knew that God had called him. Moses knew that God had a work for him to do. He knew it. And he, he wanted to do it. Right? E for effort. But he took matters in his own hands one day in Egypt. And took the life of an Egyptian. Had to run away. And so God took him. And what did he do? He put him on the back 40. For 40 years. Tending sheep. 40 years. I wonder today. How many ministers. How many ministers. On the day they recognize. God has called me into the ministry. And the Lord would say. 40 years from now, you can start. I wonder how many would meet that meeting on that 40th anniversary. We're workers together with him. We're, we're to move with him, to listen to him. And you can't do that if you don't spend time with him. How do we know what he wants to do if we're not with him? Okay, let's, verse 3. <laughs> Determination. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. One of the greatest obstacles to the ministry today is the bad examples of Christian people. Who just, well, because they don't know the Lord, they don't know how to act like Him. They don't know what pleases Him. And so Paul is saying, we got to be careful. Now, we live in a day and age where people are offended by everything. <laughs> That's not what Paul is talking about. He's talking about true offense, stumbling our brother. If you remember in Corinthians, he says, if eating meat stumbles my brother, I'll not eat flesh as long as I live. Giving none of offense to Jew or Gentile or the church of God. Paul says, I'm all things to all men that I might win some. Ministry is not about me. Ministry is about you. And when God got ready to call a man to deliver Israel, guess where he went? Well, he went to the school of ministry there in Egypt, didn't he? No, no, listen, no. He went, he went to the palace there where all the politicians... No, let's see. Hmm. He went to the business district where the CEOs know how to plan. And, and No, he went to a flock. Because that's where you find a shepherd. In the midst of sheep. So if the Lord says, I want you to sit in the midst of the sheep for 40 years. And I want you to pray for them and learn how to minister to them one on one. And move by my spirit. Because God calls a man that's already working. Do you know that? God, God doesn't say, all right, I'm going to call you. Get to work. He finds men and women who are already working. They're really walking in their calling already. I'll never forget it. I had someone that wasn't even in the ministry, was in my office one day, and I was kind of sharing with them something that I was struggling and, 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 and feeling like God was delaying. And this guy is sitting there in my little office, and he says, well, what has God called you to? I said, God's called me to be a pastor. He said, are you sure about that? I'm absolutely sure about that. And he says, what's stopping you from doing that? The light bulb went off. It was like, um, I, 
I don't know. If God's called you to pastor, start pastoring. Now that didn't mean take over a church or, or whatever, but just start pastoring people, shepherding people. Whatever God's called you to do, do that. If God's called you into worship ministry, don't wait for Sunday. The other day, the other day I was doing something at home that I do here in the church, and it hit me. I wonder how much of what we do here we do there. If there's something that you do here that you don't do there, check yourself. If you raise your hands in church, but you never raise them away from church. If you sing a certain way or pray a certain way or do a certain, if you don't do it there, I, just, just check yourself. He says, no offense. Notice because the ministry is going to be blamed. Well, I knew there was nothing to that. Just how many times has the enemy caused pastors to fall? And people look at it and say, see, see. Now, Paul's going to describe the school that he went to. We're not going to, we could spend time looking at every single one of these words. A lot of them are self-explanatory. I would encourage you to spend some time meditating and thinking through them. But Paul's going to describe the school of ministry that he went to. Now, I'm not against going to school for ministry. But Paul's going to describe the one that he went to. The good news is, the tuition, the tuition for the school of Christ, well, I would like to tell you that it's, it's reasonable. But, you would come out cheaper going to seminary and other schools because the school of Christ is going to cost you, listen, it's going to cost you everything. And the further you go into Christ, the less you take. And so Paul is going to describe the school he went to. My, oh my. Let, let's look at it. Now, real quick, a little note to, to, to jot down if you're taking notes. He's going to change prepositions as he goes through this. He's going to start with in, and then he's going to go to by, and then he's going to go to as. In, he's going to describe the college, the school of Christ. And then by, he's going to, he's going to describe the classes or the courses that, that you take in this college. And then lastly, as the accreditation or the credits or the credentials that you get as you graduate out of this class, although you never really graduate, but be that as it may. Look what he says. In, he says, but in all things approving ourselves, verse 4, as the ministers of God, the determination to be the minister. And, and can I just say, all of you that are born again, disciples of Christ are ministers. You don't have to have the title pastor. To be, so when we think about ministers and ministry, let's, let's break the churchy junk in thinking that there's a select few people at the top of the pyramid. They do the ministry. No, he's given some apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists for the working of the ministry, for the, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. The saints do the work of the ministry. Not the pastors and evangelists. So let's just keep that in mind. Look what he says. In much. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Let, let's, let's enroll today. <laughs> Patience. We've already talked a little bit about that. Let me run. Let me run. Let me go. Let me go. Moses. Uh, I'm going to get my hand. I'm going I'm to make this happen. Patience. Now. We're going to really talk about patience in a minute when he talks about long-suffering. The idea here really is endurance, to keep going, to keep going, because you're going to need some keep going in ministry, because they're not going to clap for you all the time. They're not going to say good job all the time. They might not even recognize you. They might overlook you and give somebody else the position or the title. You may put forth a lot of work and nobody shows up. I wonder if that's okay. Is it okay to show up and nobody shows up? One Wednesday night, <laughs> I came here on a Wednesday night and two people, three people showed up. Three people showed up. That's it. 
Is that okay? Yeah. You know why it's okay? Because Jesus is where two or three are gathered together in my name. I'm right there in the midst. So he starts with patience. Woohoo! Wow. Patience. Afflictions. <laughs> what a college. The school of endurance. The school of affliction, which means pressings, pressure, being pressed, as he said, on every side. Hmm. Wow. Necessities. Well, I could minister if I had this and had that and had that and had the other. If I didn't have these needs, I could minister. Or if I knew my needs would be met, I could minister. Necessities. Paul says, the college that I went to, the school of Christ, puts you in a situation where you don't have everything you need. You know why? So that you'll learn all you need is the Lord. Amen. That's why. Yeah. Distresses. That means to be put in a narrow place. Being pushed into a corner and you have no place to go. Anybody want to enroll in the school of Christ? I'm in it. Oh, don't, don't let this scare you. This is wonderful. As, we're, as a matter of fact, we're, we're going to talk to someone who's, who's been through this school when we get to chapter 12. And wow, I, I'm not there. I, I'm still in class. But this guy says, bring it on. The worse it gets, the more I like it. Whew. I'm not there. Pray for me. Pray for me. In stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, which means... Riots or confusions and labors. That means working to exhaustion. Yeah, I want to be a preacher because it's an easy job. <laughs> I've even heard people say, pastors don't do nothing. I've heard people say, well, he don't, you don't, well, you know, you don't work like we do. Paul says, work in watchings. That means sleepless nights. Many a night, Paul says, I didn't get to sleep. And he says in fastings, doing without food. So those are the in. And do you know the Bible says we are in Christ. All of this is in Christ. And we're told in, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now he moves to the by. Right here are the courses, the classes that we take. By pureness. Moral character. Man, that's lacking in the church today. People think they can live any way they want to live. Show up on Sunday. Party like a rock star on Saturday night and lead the congregation in worship on Sunday morning. Pureness. By knowledge. This word knowledge is not educationally, but intimacy. It's intimate knowledge. To know the Lord. He showed his acts unto the children of Israel, but his ways unto Moses. It's one thing to know the shepherd's psalm, Psalm 23. It's another to know the shepherd of the psalm. This knowledge, long-suffering, that means being patient with difficult people. I know that goes both ways. I understand. That goes both ways. When is the last time, and this is for me too, right now, right now, when is the last time you thanked God for that difficult person in your life? Because if you're in the college, you're in the course. You see, you, these are not electives, church. <laughs> we, don't, we don't get to choose. You know what? I'm going to sign up for long suffering this semester. You don't, you don't choose that. He chooses for you. He says, you go to this class at this time and you show up and go, what? And there's no drop ad. You're in it. You're in it. And we ought to thank God for those difficult people. Because by them, by, right? Zechariah 4, 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. We were predestined to be conformed in the image of his son. God is long-suffering. 
As Moses found out on that mountain, as God showed his glory. That's one of the things he revealed. He's long suffering towards us. And that's part of his character and nature. I love long suffering when God's being long suffering to me. I don't like it when he's wanting me to be long suffering to thee. <laughs> but this is the class. And listen, church, if you've ever prayed stuff like this during times of worship, I, as I've gotten older in the Lord, I'm, I'm coming to realize the prayers that were prayed from my heart, that the Holy Spirit anointed within me, I had no idea what I was praying. I'm glad I prayed them, but I had no stuff like this. Lord, make me like you. I want to be like you, Lord. Develop in me the fruit of your spirit, your nature, your character. I want them to see Jesus in me. You know, those kind of prayers. Then you walk into class and you sit down with that difficult person. And then you start praying this prayer. Lord, get this person out of my life. They're on my last nerve. They're at the limits of my medication. And Jesus is saying, I'm answering your prayer. Yes. Yes. By kindness, that's grace in action. Just displaying God's grace, grace, grace. By the Holy Ghost, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. By love unfeigned, that means pure, unadulterated, without hypocrisy, genuine love, not... Bless you, brother. How you doing? Oh, I'm blessed by the best. Not that foolish stuff. You know, not like we talked about last week. Where we got this thing in America. Where we're like, hey, how you doing? And we just walk right on past somebody. The language implies we care about them. But the action says otherwise. Hey, how you doing? And we do that with the Lord. We do that with, one. hey, how you doing? How you doing? No. That's love unfeigned. By the word of truth. And can I say something that might shock some of you, but I need to say this this morning. We do not come here. We do not come here for Bible study. I love this book. I've spent my life since 15 years old reading it through again and again and again. I love it. I, I, I'm like a sponge still. I have an appetite still as I did when he saved me. I like to devour this book. But this is not the end. You know, Father, Son, and the Holy Bible? No. Jesus says, you search the scripture for in them you think you have life. And they are they that testify of me. This is a means to an end. This is not the end. And I hope you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm a Bible guy, right? I'm not diminishing the book. But a lot of people just show up and they read the book and they just... Because isn't the word of truth Jesus himself? And the word became flesh. John 1. By the power of God. Wow. We need God, God's power. By the armor of righteousness. On the right hand. On the left. You better ready for battle. And it's his, his armor. The helmet of salvation. His saving grace. The belt of truth. His truth. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. His gospel. Not man's. Right? The shield of faith. That's faith in him. Not faith in faith. Amen. The sword of the spirit. Not my sword. By honor and dishonor. What? Yes. By honor and dishonor. Oh, wait a minute. I, I don't think I like that class. I want to be honored. I want to be honored. I want to be applauded. I want to be appreciated. I, I want the applause of men. And Jesus rebuked the religious leaders of his day. It was a hindrance in their life. Are we ready this morning to live in abject dishonor when it comes to man so that we can stand in honor before God? I know we, we're quick. I'm quick. Just, yes, amen. 
That's why these times are so important. God's doing this in us in these times. That's what this is about. Honor and dishonor by evil reporting, good report as deceivers, yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold, we live as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor. Hold up. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I bet that faith preacher wishes Paul had read the faith manual. If Paul would have had the faith he was supposed to have, the man wouldn't have been poor. Because we all know that the true minister of God. It's one of the problems they had with Paul. Paul would show up in Corinth. And he'd go make tents. He worked with his hands. I'm amazed when we have work days and things around the church and I'll grab a chair or two and it never, never ceases to amaze me. People are like, oh, no, 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 pastor. No, no, pastor. We'll get that. We'll get that. I'm like, you ain't going to steal my blessing. Get away. I'm going to carry a chair too. If the toilet needs to... Uh, go in there and the toilet's running. I'm not a plumber, so if anybody knows plumbing, that, that toilet in there, get with me. Anyway, there's been times I come in, that thing's just running, running, running. I take the lid off and I'm going to try, right? I don't want to lose my blessing. Paul's poor, he says. <laughs> We've come a long way, haven't we? We've come a long way. The ministers of day are no different than the politicians, completely and totally out of touch with the people they're supposed to be serving. They have no idea what the real world is like. So they can look down their hypocritical noses at everybody else. Hmm. Well, anyway. Hmm. As poor yet, making many rich. Wow. Making many rich. As having nothing... And yet possessing all things. Wow, what a coarse collection. I, I shared something on Facebook. I normally don't do our church Facebook page, but I just I, I was just praying the other day and, and and posted something. If you follow us on Facebook, you might have seen it, but Paul in Philippians chapter four says. He uses three verbs to describe. He says, I have learned, I know, I've been instructed to be content. In whatever state I am, I know how to abound, I know how to be abased. I, I know how to be hungry, and I know how to be full. That's the school, church. That's the course, study. All intended for you and I to recognize and understand. All I need is Jesus. That's all I need. And I know it's cliche and it is not. It is true. Philippians 4.13. You know the verse that we take and we put it in gyms. We put it on you know, motorcycles and sports cars. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Completely take it out of context. And use it so I can pump a little bit more iron. I can do all things. We, motivationally, we use it. And that is not what Paul was saying. Paul was saying, when my belly is rubbing the two sides together. And I have no smell of barbecue in the vicinity. I'm okay. Paul goes into one town and they say he's a God and try to offer a sacrifice to him. He goes in another town and they stone him and leave him for dead. Which one would you rather have? Good question. Which one would you rather have? And the answer is both. I'm instructed. Both. Paul says. We have this expectation today that if you're going to serve Jesus, well, this is going to happen and that's going to happen and that's going to happen. Who said? Who said this or that's going to happen? Does it matter what happens? 
So we've got the college, we've got the courses. He says, oh, Corinthians, our mouth is opened unto you. Our heart is enlarged. Paul says, I don't have pursed lips, tight-lipped, holding a grudge against you, accusing me of being fickle and changing my plans, accusing me of not being an apostle, accusing me of, of not really teaching the truth. I, my heart is open to you. Is that not the heart of God? He says, you are not straightened in us, but you are straightened in your own bowels. Straightened there means to be restricted, to be hindered. We use, you know, like, I love you with my whole heart. Those kind of, we, we talk about the heart, but biblically, the gut was the seat and center of emotion. And in reality, in psychology, it really is. You know, a guttural response. When is the last time you lived from that place? With conviction or courage or compassion or contentment from the very core of your very being I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me and Paul's just reaching out to these people he says now for a recompense in the same I speak as unto my children be also enlarged he says church you're bigger than this. Be bigger. Be bigger. Open your heart. Do you know that the majority of the people in this room are afraid to open their heart? Now, some of you are going to make me look like a novice, but do you know I have over 400 friends? It says it right there on Facebook. <laughs> Over 400. I don't even know them. <laughs> intimacy. If you really want a simple definition of intimacy, it's in to me, you see. Intimacy. He says, open your heart, church. And that's what God, I believe, is saying today to the church. There's discontent and there's unrest in the church. And they're like, oh, well, God's moving us because of discontentment and unrest. No, he isn't. If he's trying to develop contentment in you, he's not going to use discontent to move you. What he's trying to do is to get you to be still and know that he is God. Open your heart. But then he gives a warning. Verse 14. Open your heart, but be bigger, but be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord? We get our word symphony from this Greek word concord. What harmony? Timing and tempo hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath the believer with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wow. Cooperation as we as we just work with the Lord, determination. Lord, here I am. Have your way, as we sang in worship. Have your way by pureness, by your spirit, by long suffering, by kindness, by love unfeigned. Have your way. Do you know that these things are not wished into our lives? You, you can't get motivated enough. To make it happen. You ever seen a fruit tree? <gasps> you know, develop fruit like that? No. That's not how it works. The fruit comes from the root. It comes from abiding. Just abiding in Christ. 
Staying put, stay in the course that he's got you in right now. Oh, Gordon, you have no idea. Hey, you have no idea what somebody else is going through. You're thinking, I'm going through the toughest course in all the school of Christ. <laughs> you think that. You think that. Separation. Living a life that is pleasing to the Lord. The church, I know this is not a shouting message. The church is worldly. It really is worldly. We have a worldly church today. They've brought all the gimmicks, the gizmos, and the gadgets from the world into the church. And we're relevant. We're current. We're up to date. We think. But do we know God? Do we know God? The seven sons of Sceva said, oh, we can do that. They went out and found a guy, demon-possessed. We adjure you in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. Ooh, that sounds exciting, don't it? And boys were charismatic. The demon says, Jesus, we know. And Paul, we know. Who are you? That's today's church. Satan is running amok, having his way, doing whatever he wants. And the church doesn't even know it because she's in love with the world. We are witnessing the Laodicean church today. We are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. But they're poor, wretched, blind. Naked. Look what he says. Verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them. Can you hear him this morning calling you? I don't know where you're at. I don't know anything about your lives. Don't come up to me afterwards. Just, Whoa. I don't know what's going on. The Lord knows what's going on. And he's calling you out. There are things in your life that look just like the world. You say, well, Gordon, that's judgmental. No, I, me too. Me too. He, I, you could walk with me for a week and you, you'd fill up a little steno book. What about that, Gordon? What about that? Well, don't touch the on your business. Yeah, we, we, we all have that stuff. And all the time the Lord says, come out, come out, come out. Can you hear him calling? There's Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees. And God says, Abraham, get out. Get out of your land. Get out from among your people. I'm going to take you somewhere. Lot. Lot was there in Sodom. Should have never been there. There he was. And the angel said, get out. Get out. Get out. We're going to destroy this place. Get out. Jacob had to learn some lessons in the school of hard knocks where the colors were black and blue. God had him met his match with old Laban, another conniver and schemer. And when he was there and God had taught him what he needed to learn in that, the Lord says, get out of this land and go back to where I called you. And the church today looks like the prodigal. For years now, we've sung songs and prayed prayers like this. Give me what's mine. Bless me. I want to live under the spout where the glory comes out. Bless me, bless me, bless me. And we've been in love with the blessing. We wanted nothing to do with the blesser. And so we took those blessings and we went into the world and enjoyed them. And like Samson, one day we shook ourselves. We shook ourselves. And we did it harder. See, life takes a turn. The doctor gives a diagnosis. A layoff notice is given. A job wraps up. All kinds of things. You get a call in the middle of the night. 
Don't shake yourself. There in the pig pen with nothing left. Oh, but the most important thing was always there. Because while he was out doing his thing, his way, bless me, bless me, bless me. You know what the prodigal was actually saying? I wish you were dead. Because the only way to get the inheritance is for daddy to die. So this bless me club that the church is a part of is really saying, I wish you could just get out of the way and let us get the stuff we wanted, which is what Satan accused God of with Job. If you take all this stuff that's in his life, he'll curse you to your face. It's the only reason they serve you. They don't serve you for who you are. They serve you for the goodies. Gus says, okay, I'll take you up on that wager. Could he with me? Could he with you? What and if God took everything from you today? Would you be here next Sunday? He come to himself and he says, I'm going home. I'm going home. Wherefore come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. And I will, what? I will receive you. That's the good news this morning. No matter where we are, He'll receive us if we'll return. And look what he says. Last verse. And I'll be a father unto you. And you should be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I want to be a father to you. You're my son. You're my daughter. I want a relationship with you. You. And so it's vital that we understand what ministry is. It's good today that we've been reminded by our brother Paul what ministry is because based on what we believe ministry is, is going to determine what kind of church we are. Because if we're to cooperate and work with him if we're determined that we're going to let him do whatever he wants to do in our life and we're going to be separate from the world and not live in sin. We're not going to be like the dog who returns to his vomit or the sow to her wallowing in the mire because we want to be in relationship with the Father. Remember the beginning of our study? Jesus is my Father, 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 my Father. That's what it was about. We talked about the Laodicean church. The very first one that Jesus deals with is the church of Ephesus. And here's what he says. I'm closing with this. I know thy works. You're working. Man, Ephesus, you are a working church. You are working. I know your works. I know your labor. You are laboring. You're there every Sunday. You're turning on sound system, lights, fog. You're doing all those kind of things, signs. You're doing all, you're working, working, working. You can't stand those who say they're apostles and are not. You've, you, you've determined who's right and who's not right. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you've left your first love. You've left your first love. The Father says, I want to be in relationship with you every day. You're my son. You're my daughter. And I just want you to spend time. Well, Father, we can't. I'm busy. Some of you, some of you older saints in here have experienced this. You spend your whole life raising your kids up and then they get married and they move out. Thankfully, I haven't experienced this, but I know many saints who have. And day goes by and day goes by and week goes by and month goes by. They hear nothing. They're nothing. And if you would ask the children, what's the deal? Why don't you call mom? Why don't you call dad? I'm busy. And I think the church is like that. We're busy. We're busy. I just want to be a father to you. When's the last time 
He just stopped and said, Father, I'm here. And it, that's about how long it takes for the awkwardness to hit you. Especially when we're not used to it. We hate that. We hate that. Some of you are like, what is he doing? Because <laughs> we have a wall of noise. Constant busyness. Busyness. And the father steps out on the front porch every morning. Looks down that driveway. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. And the next day, maybe tomorrow. And today we could say, Father, we're coming home. And he'll receive you. Restore you in fellowship. Wow. Let's stand.